This case deals with vivid descriptions of mutilation along with SA. It's possibly the darkest case I've done so far, so if it's not something you wish to listen to, please click out now. In 1997, a sex worker who we'll call Mary received a disturbing phone call. It was so horrific, she later quit. This man rang and asked to speak to an elderly lady. To appease her client, Mary pretended to be a 55-year-old woman. The man went on to say how he killed the bitch. When asked who he was talking about, the man said it was his mother. He then went on to describe how he pressed his hand against her neck while slicing her nipple off. When talking about the blood, he clearly became very aroused. Mary, horrified, hung up. The man called back and said he knew who she was and where she lived. He then went on to describe how he attacks women. He stated that he looks into his victim's eyes while he stabs them in the stomach. He then uses the blade to fuck them. The man at this point was incredibly aroused. He was breathing heavily. Mary was so stunned that she was just kind of listening in fear. She then hung up and pulled the phone call out of the wall. My name's Emma, this is Tiki Bar True Crimes, and I'd like to tell you the case of Peter Dupas. Peter Dupas was one of three siblings. He was considerably younger and often treated like an only child. He was never beaten, he was often spoilt and came from a very average family. He grew up mainly in Melbourne, Australia. Although his home life was relatively average, his school life was a very different story. He was quite pudgy shall we say and often bullied he developed lots of fatty deposits around his nipple area and he was often teased about that at school he didn't have many friends and the people that did talk to him often thought he was very odd in 1968 when peter was 15 years old he went round to his neighbor's house to ask for a knife because he was going to peel potatoes for his parents he was very well acquainted with his neighbours and at the time it was just the wife at home nursing their baby. She commented on what a good boy he was, what a good son and went to get him a knife. She handed Peter the knife and he stood there staring at her for a while. She asked if he was okay and then he launched into a vicious attack. He stabbed her in the head the neck and the hands. She fought him off as best as she could and screamed as much as she could in order to stop this just vicious random assault. Peter did eventually stop and she contacted police. The neighbour was left with only superficial injuries that was incredibly lucky to be honest with you. When the police eventually caught up with Peter they asked him why did you do this? He just said, I don't know. For this random assault, he was given 18 months probation and sent for a psychiatric evaluation at a institution. He was treated as an outpatient. And as far as I can see, there weren't many rules. So no one really like made sure that he came for his appointments or anything. So for this assault, which he could have killed her if she didn't fight back as much as she did, he was basically not really punished at all. One year later, someone breaks into the local mortuary and inflicts wounds on two elderly women. They use a knife and cut them, particularly along their thighs. This is later believed to be Peter. In 1973, at the age of 20, Peter broke into a woman's home with a knife. He grabbed her baby and threatened to injure this infant if she did not comply. He tied the woman up with cord and proceeded to SA her. This woman managed to identify Peter and he was brought in and questioned. A police officer who questioned Peter later said, He stood out. To me the guy was just pure evil. We could see where he was going. This guy could go all the way. He's a very dangerous young person who will continue to offend where females are concerned. 
He was convicted with the judge stating that this was one of the worst SAs he had ever come across. He was given nine years and requested to serve a minimum of five. He was sent also for a psychiatric report. The psychiatrist who examined him stated that Peter is in just pure denial of any of his wrongdoings. And this is very concerning. Denial means that he can't be helped if he doesn't admit to what he's done and that it's wrong. We can't rehabilitate him. Also, if he isn't acknowledging that what he's doing is wrong, this makes him a very dangerous man. So this man can't be rehabilitated and he has no remorse or even acknowledgement that what he's doing is awful. He serves the minimum time for this attack, which was five years. He is released and two months later, he attacks four women in 10 days. He is arrested, questioned and charged. He goes to trial and the police believe that this is it. He's gonna go in for life. He's a dangerous man. He shows no remorse. He is disturbed, he is immature and his parole last time was a mistake. However, he gets five years. The police by this point are horrified and he serves his five years, is released. Just one month after he is released, Peter is driving down the road and he sees a woman. He decides to pull over and stalk her for a while. He then comes up behind her, pushes her to the floor, threatens her with a knife and essays her. He attacks another woman just one month after his release. When questioned, why are you doing this? He says, I thought I was cured. I thought I could live a normal life but it just came over me. He is tried and convicted and given 12 years. Of this 12 year sentence, he serves just seven. And after being released, two years later, he stalks another woman into a toilet block. She's out picnicking with her friends and he follows her in there with a knife and tape. He tries to hold her at knife point and again attack her. She causes such a commotion that her friends come rushing to see what's going on. They chase Peter out of the area. He gets into his car and races off. The friends follow and Peter eventually crashes his car and that's how police pick him up. Again, this guy is tried and convicted. He is convicted this time of false imprisonment. He is sentenced to three years and nine months. You would have thought he would have gotten a much greater sentence than three years and nine months, of which he only served two and nine. But that doesn't just seem to be the case at all. Whilst in prison for two years and nine months, he develops a relationship with his psychiatrist or mental health nurse. Her name is Grace McConnell and she is 16 years older than Peter. Grace said that she never really fancied Peter or it was never really a loving relationship. In fact, she saw it more as a mother and son relationship. However, Peter kept saying that Grace was the one that could reform him. Grace was the one that could make him a normal person. So Grace took pity on him and ended up marrying him. He actually used that marriage though when he went for his parole board meeting. They moved to the suburbs of Melbourne together and Grace said that their relationship it was boring their sex life was boring in fact she said peter was a very dull kind of non-volatile man she thought she had reformed him if they ever got into an argument peter would just kind of sit and stare off into space he wouldn't lash out in anger so she thought her job was done and it also got to the stage where she was repulsed by his touch so they ended up divorcing at 2 p.m. on the 4th of October in 1997, a husband and wife, along with her sister, are looking for scrap metal down Clifford's Road. This is a well-known road for people illegally discarding rubbish, and they're looking for things that they might be able to sell on. The husband picks up a box of technical parts, looks like computer things, and suddenly sees a hand. Initially, the wife thinks it's a mannequin. The husband takes a closer look and sees a head and a tattoo. He then says, I don't think this is a mannequin. 
They immediately call police who arrive on the scene. They begin searching the area and they find a black glove nearby which they hope will lead them to the perpetrator. They run a DNA test on it but it comes up with nothing. They immediately know the victim. She is a well-known sex worker in the area. The lady is Margaret Mayer. She is 40 years old and she was last seen food shopping at around 1am that day. When examining her body, they saw that she had suffered incredibly. She had multiple stab wounds, a cinder block had been smashed into her right eye, and one of her breasts had been removed with a very sharp knife and placed in her mouth. The police have no idea who would commit such a heinous crime. One month later, in November, 25-year-old Messina is attending to her grandmother's grave she's kneeling down and arranging the flowers when suddenly someone attacks her from behind they proceed to stab her 87 times mainly around the breast area and the knees her screams were heard by other people in the graveyard but dismissed because of this the keeper locked the graveyard for the night and later that day when she didn't return home her fiance became very very worried he went looking for her everywhere and when they finally opened the gates to the graveyard he went in to discover her lifeless body just three graves down from her grandmother's. This absolutely horrified the town and the police ended up offering a $1 million reward for any evidence leading to the perpetrator. Several witnesses did actually say that they saw Peter lurking around. An elderly man named Frank Cole did say that he saw Peter lurking around the graveyard. Another woman said she was attending to a family grave when she saw an unknown man approaching her. He sped up and she instinctively put her hand out to stop him. He stopped, she screamed, and he sort of ran half-heartedly away. She thought he was gone, but as she began to walk through the graveyard, she noticed his feet sticking out from under a brush. She realized he'd been following her and she just legged it, hopping over graves to her husband who was waiting in the car in the car park. She told him about this man. She didn't know who he was, but found him very, very disturbing. Two years go by and these cases remain unsolved. Then in 1999, Nicole Patterson, who is a counsellor, has started up her own practice. She works from home and is really keen to build her client base. She puts many classified ads in local papers and on this particular day, she calls a friend to say she's very excited because she's going to meet a new client. At around 9am that day, neighbours hear chilling screams coming from Nicole's house. One neighbour who is further down the road and attending to his car sees a man walking quite briskly from Nicole's house. He smiles and has an acknowledgement to say hello, but this man has his head down and walks very quickly past. Nicole's boyfriend tries to contact her during the day and he can't get through to her and this is starting to worry him. That evening, Nicole actually has a dinner date with her friend and her friend turns up to Nicole's house. She hears music inside and she also hears Nicole's dog barking outside in the rear garden. She decides to go in. The door is unlocked and she thinks maybe Nicole's just still getting ready. As she enters the front room, she sees Nicole lying on the floor and it looks like she's got an orange top on. However, as she approached, she quickly realized that that wasn't an orange top that she could see. That was the fatty tissue under her breasts. Both of her breasts had been removed. Horrified, her friend ran from the house and contacted police. Nicole had been stabbed 27 times, mainly in the chest and the back. Both of her breasts had been removed with a sharp knife. These breasts have never been found. They also found random mini bits of tape all over her body. She was naked from the waist down and her underwear was around her ankles. 
Seemingly at first glance, the perpetrator had done a very good job at not leaving any evidence. There was actually little blood and no DNA or anything was really left. However, under some blankets in the living room, they found Nicole's diary. In this, she had written an appointment for 9am that day with a man that she called Malcolm, along with a telephone number. Police immediately start suspecting this client as on the table in the kitchen, there were two coffee mugs. There was no forced entry, so this person had been welcomed in and pleasantries had been exchanged. They traced this number to an Indian student. They quickly realized after surveying this man that he wasn't the perpetrator. They did question him and through questioning, they realized that he was previously offered some laboring jobs by Peter Dupass. He had given Peter his number. Peter is obviously well known to the police and they now believe that Peter has used this student's number as a decoy. They arrest Peter Dupass and question him. Through phone records, they can see that Peter actually called Nicole multiple times over a six week period. They believe he did this in order to ascertain how vulnerable she was. So this was very much a carefully sought out planned attack. They also notice that Peter has scratch marks all over his face. He says that this is because he did some work with a lathe, although he didn't own a lathe at the time. When they question him about this and say, but you don't even own one of those, he changes his story and says, oh, it was just on a random piece of wood. They search his home and they find bloodstained clothing, tape, which was similar to that found on Nicole's body, newspaper clippings about Nicole Patterson's death, a ski mask and also papers advertising for psychotherapy services. Peter was found guilty in 2000 and sentenced to life without parole. He finally gets the sentence that he deserves. The judge says that rehabilitation will never be possible for a man like this. He didn't think Peter was even capable of showing any remorse. He was incapable of having any empathy towards any others. And this was incredibly disconcerting as it raised the question of how did he become like this? At this point, obviously, DNA analysis is much more advanced and they managed to get Peter's DNA. They run this through the database and realise that it matches the black glove found at Margaret Mayer's crime scene. This was the lady that the husband and wife found whilst searching for scrap metal. Her breast had been removed and placed in her mouth and she had been stabbed multiple times. The sad story about Margaret Mayer was she was actually a very normal woman. I think she was a bank clerk and lived a very normal life until someone introduced her to heroin. Sadly, due to addiction, she ended up in the sex working industry. She was trying to put her life back together though and had recently moved in with a family member to reconnect. That opportunity to reconnect with family members and get her life back on the track that it was previously was completely taken away by Peter. He was tried and convicted of Margaret Mayer's death and when he left he shouted out that it was a kangaroo court. He clearly didn't like the way he had been treated and thought it was a joke. It took the jury less than a day to convict him and he was given a second term of life imprisonment. The judge said that there was no glimmer of hope for Peter and basically he should never see the light of day again. The victim's family described Peter as a repulsive person who would smirk in the courtroom. He clearly showed no remorse or emotion towards what he had done. Two years later, in 2006, they decide to hold an inquest to look into the death of Marissa. This was the young 25-year-old woman attending to her grandmother's grave. A lot of the evidence they had was circumstantial, but they wanted to see how it fitted all together. 
This circumstantial evidence included nine witnesses who placed Peter at the cemetery that day. One woman actually picked his photograph out from a lineup and said that she saw him meters from Marissa. Peter also altered his appearance after the murder of Marissa. He also sold his car, which later ended up being scrapped, so no DNA analysis or forensics could ever be done. This was all very circumstantial. However, a disgraced lawyer, Andrew Fraser, who served time alongside Peter, Andrew was convicted of drug trafficking and he became good friends with Peter in this maximum security jail. He stated that four years earlier, when he was in prison with Peter, Peter actually confessed to murdering Marissa. So Andrew Fraser was a high-flying lawyer. He represented really well-known clients. However, with that success came a lot of downfall. He got addicted to cocaine and in 1999, he was sentenced to five years in prison for importing cocaine. Whilst in prison with Peter, they were attending to the garden when Andrew found a homemade knife. He called Peter over to say, oh, have a look at this. Peter grabbed it, was handling it, and then clearly became very aroused sexually. He started muttering under his breath, Marissa, Marissa. Andrew said he was in no doubt that Peter definitely murdered this young woman. He said that him and Peter were good friends and that he would often confide in him. On one occasion, another prisoner ran up to Peter and said, you did it, you did it, you killed Marissa. This was actually Marissa's cousin. Peter turned to Andrew and said, how the does that see you next Tuesday know that I did it? Andrew agrees to testify in court and because of this, he is actually eligible for that $1 million reward. He claims it, how much he gets is undisclosed, but he does receive a portion of it or all of it. Peter is convicted of Marissa's death and gets a third life sentence. Along with these three murders, Peter is also suspected of murdering Helen McMahon. She's a 47 year old woman who was sunbathing topless at the beach when she was viciously attacked. She was found with a beach towel covering her and although this case is officially unsolved, police believe this was Peter. He's also suspected of murdering 31-year-old Renita Brunton who owned a shop. She was stabbed 106 times. Peter is currently serving his life sentence in a maximum secure prison. Prison officers say he is a model prisoner. I think this case really highlights how giving offenders small sentences, especially in cases like this, just allows them to re-offend again and again and again. It was just basically a huge miscarriage of justice. The warning signs were there when he was 15 years old and he randomly attacked his neighbor for no reason at all. However, he was given minimum sentence after minimum sentence after minimum sentence, which just allowed him to continue with his crimes and get worse and worse and worse. My name's Emma. This has been the case of Peter Dupass. If you like my content, please remember to like, subscribe and comment and I will see you in the next one.